Try to describe the career of Mike Seeger, and it sounds like an entire social movement, not just one guy. He was among the folk revival's most important musicians, collectors, record producers, teachers, organizers, and promoters of traditional legends like Doc Boggs, Cousin Emmy, and Tommy Gerald. He was a profoundly influential master of guitar, fiddle, banjo, mandolin, and auto harp. As a performer, his repertoire was so vast that Bob Dylan says one reason he started writing songs was so he could sing something that Mike didn't already know. And with the new Lost City Ramblers, Mike ignited an old-time music revival that's still going strong, in large part because of how the Ramblers ignited it. I am a man of constant sorrow. I've seen trouble all my day. Incredibly, Mike did all these jobs at the same time. Being a concert star was no more important to him than recording some unknown banjo picker or producing anthologies of southern fiddle styles. But then the heart of Mike's genius, always, was that he saw folk as a we music, not a me music. I'll meet you on God's golden shore. He was born into America's first family of folk in 1933. His father, Charles Seeger, was a legendary collector and scholar. His mother, Ruth Crawford Seeger, wrote piano arrangements of folk songs that were used by millions of teachers in American classrooms. And when older half-brother Pete visited, Ruth let the kids stay home from school, reasoning they'd learn more from him. Even the family domestic worker got into the act, teaching Mike and younger sister Peggy her own unique guitar style. Her name? Elizabeth Cotton. And you can add to Mike's many careers that he made her a star and kept her one all her life. Freight train, freight train, we're on so fast. Freight train, freight train, we're on so fast. Please don't tell what train I'm on so they won't know what route I'm going. Mike was particularly drawn to the southern folk music known as old time. In later years, Mike coined his own term, music from the true vine, which he described as the home music made by American southerners before the media age. Mike's musical tastes and intent shyness, which some mistakenly took as aloofness, often made him an outsider, a trait probably not helped by a teenaged obsession with unicycle riding. His first important musical contributions were as producer of crucial 1950s anthologies that introduced bluegrass to new urban and northern audiences. The band that would become the new Lost City Ramblers actually formed on the radio, invited to jam on air in 1958. Mike vaguely knew John Cohen and Tom Paley, who'd organized the Hootenannies at Yale. But the moment they played together, it felt like family. They quickly signed with Folkways Records and did their first concert at Carnegie Hall, even though the trio hadn't thought up a name yet. Folkways' Mo Ash said they should use the word city because they were urban musicians. No one remembers quite how the rest tumbled into place. For the record, there never was an old Lost City Ramblers. The name was simply a clever collision of old and new, urban and rural, hip and retro, that would define their sound and their impact. While the Ramblers adhered closely to traditional styles of playing, they presented themselves as exactly who they were, northern urban intellectuals who loved southern folk music. This honesty was more significant then than it seems today, because it told a new generation that you don't have to be southern, or pretend to be, to play southern folk music. But even as the Ramblers revolutionized the way the music could be performed, they sought to preserve it as a social music, a we music. The Ramblers didn't just play for their audiences, they played with them, inviting pickers in the crowd to join them on stage and jamming all night at local music parties. 
As the 60s revival declined, a new generation of folk musicians were drawn to the social joys of traditional instrumental music. They ignited a new old-time revival centered around folk dancing and jam sessions, protecting the music from the fickle winds of commercialism by making it part of the social life of their community. They quickly rediscovered Mike and the Ramblers, valuing their careers more for their friendly focus on jamming than their impact as recording artists. That shy boyhood distance never left Mike. He popped the question to his third wife, Alexia Smith, with the immortal line, Are you movable? Mike was that rare artist who grew from apprentice to elder without really changing what he was doing. Until his death in 2011, he continued a dizzying pace of touring, recording, teaching, collecting, producing, organizing festivals, and helping folk arts organizations. All this was probably much simpler to Mike as he lived it than it seems to us as we wonder how he could have done it all. A mesmerized college student said it best, Mike Seeger allowed the music to become alive and real to us. And that's really it, isn't it? That was Mike Seeger's job. He made the music live for all of us. Upon the Blue Ridge Mountain there I'll take my stand Upon the Blue Ridge Mountain There I'll take my stand With a rifle on my shoulder Six shooter in my hand Lord, Lord, I've been all around this world Lulu, my Lulu Come and open the door Lulu, my Lulu Oh, come and open the door Before I have to open it with my old 44 Lord, Lord, I've been all around this world 